Okay, so let's start our quick journey into the Perl programming language by looking at the data types and the notation for accessing data types. And here we start with what is probably the most criticized part of Perl, namely uh, these, um, these prefixes that indicate which variable uh, we're talking about, what type of uh, value is returned when we access the value of a uh, Perl variable. Um, Perl has three types of variables. There are scalar variables. These are for things like strings and numbers, but also references to other objects. Then there are arrays of scalars and there are associative arrays, also known as hash tables. And each of these three data types or types of variables um, is named in its own namespace. So there is one namespace for scalar variables, there is a namespace for array variables, and there is a namespace for hash tables. And as a result, in the same program, you can have with dollar days a scalar variable, and with at days an array, and with percent days a hash table of the same name. To refer to an array element, you follow the name of the variable with square brackets, whereas to query a hash table, you use uh, curly braces. But what may seem initially a bit confusing is that this initial uh, letter, or sometimes also called a sigil, uh, the dollar sign, the at sign, and the percent sign, is not selecting which namespace the following uh, name is taken from. It instead indicates what type of value you can expect as a return. So if you uh, access the array days, which is on its own written as at days, by accessing it with square brackets, then the square brackets here indicate that whatever appears before here as a name comes from the array namespace. But in the language, it's still preceded by a dollar sign because what is returned by this access to an array is in fact a scalar value. So this was motivated a little bit by uh, being like a pronoun, that a dollar sign indicates what now follows is like singular, whereas an at sign indicates whatever is coming now is uh, plural. Um, <clears throat> So here we see a, a reference to the uh, 29th element, because arrays start with zero, of the uh, array days, whereas here we look up uh, the value associated with the key February in the, uh, in the hash table days. There's also this syntax, if you use the number sign followed by days, that is the last index of the array at days. <clears throat> you can also write out the entire array days as this comma separated list of the individual elements, which start with dollar days zero and go all the way to dollar days. And this is the index of the last array. <clears throat> there is also a so-called uh, slice syntax where you can refer to multiple uh, elements of an array, for example, the element number three, four, or five, which you can also refer to by three dot dot five. And because here you actually return an array and not a scalar, we have the at sign here in front. Similarly, if in a hash table we refer to multiple keys, then what you get back is an array of the values associated with these keys, which is why you see here the array sign. You can also assign uh, to a hash table an array and then the uh, elements of the arrays will be interpreted as pairs of key value, key value, and so on. So what counts as a scalar value? I mentioned a scalar can hold either a string or a number or 
a reference, it can in fact hold a fourth special value called undef, which doesn't point to anything in particular and can therefore be used to, for example, indicate that this scalar variable hasn't been initialized yet. And you can test whether something is not the undef value by using the defined function. For strings in modern versions of Perl, there are actually two flavors of strings. A string knows whether it is either a list of bytes or it's a list of Unicode characters. Before the introduction of Unicode, there was kind of a one-to-one -one mapping between bytes and characters as long as only 8-bit uh, coded character sets were used. But with Unicode, which is commonly used on Unix in the UTF-8 multi-byte encoding, uh, characters can be one, two, three, or even four bytes long. And <clears throat> if you then refer to the next element in a string, it's useful for the interpreter to know whether you refer to the next byte or the to the next character. And there is a bit that comes with every Perl string to indicate whether this is meant to be a string of bytes or a string of characters. The <clears throat> If, if you store a number in a uh, scalar, these are automatically converted as needed between either string representations of numbers or integer numbers or floating point numbers. Internally, you can think of a scalar actually as a, a struct that has three elements, namely the string version of a number, the float and the integer version of the number. And there are three bits that indicate which of these uh, encodings are currently valid. And if a scalar value doesn't have uh, readily available the string representation or say the float representation, then Perl converts automatically and stores the converted version. So you don't have to manually convert. It's done for you. You can do things like five minus the string three will have the integer value uh, 2 or uh, you can for example associate if if there is a string that doesn't start with any digits then the numeric integer or float value of that string will automatically be taken as zero um, <clears throat> Perl doesn't have an explicit uh, boolean type Instead, it has the convention that if you evaluate any string expression, any scalar expression in a Boolean context, then there are exactly four values that are interpreted as false and everything else is interpreted as true. And these four values are the empty string, the number zero, either integer or float, the uh, string consisting of only the zero digit and the undefined uh, value. And finally, scalar values can also be uh, references. These are pointers that know what type of object they are pointing to. And these references uh, point in Perl to objects that have reference counting. So whenever you overwrite all the uh, references that may be stored in scalars um, to an object, then the object uh, the reference count of the object will drop to zero and the memory for the object uh, will be deallocated automatically. A literal in a programming language is the syntax you use to write down uh, constants. So the scalar literals in Perl are uh, for numbers uh, very similar to what you know from C. So a decimal number is any number that doesn't start with a zero. If a number does start with a zero, uh, but not is not followed by an X, then it's interpreted as an octal number, as a base eight number, um, which isn't that commonly used anymore, except in Unix uh, with a couple of special application. For example, the mode bits uh, in the file system come as groups of three bits and therefore the octal number remains very useful for these. And if a number starts with 0x, then it's interpreted as a hexadecimal number. As soon as a number contains a full stop or an e for the decimal exponent, then it's treated as a floating point number. 
In addition to the C syntax, you can also increase the legibility of long numbers by putting as a spacer the underscore character in. That's a notational convention that was copied from the ADA programming language. String constants have a string interpolation facility very similar but not quite identical to the shell. So if you have inside uh, double quoted uh, strings any dollar signs or any at signs or any percent signs, then these will be interpreted as meta character that introduce a variable and the value, they will be substituted with the value of that uh, <clears throat> variable or variable access expression syntax. So for example, here we are compiling a uh, two lines from an email message header and we are inserting after the words from colon uh, the ith element of the uh, array name. Then we insert a literal at sign which we have to escape with a backslash because at would refer to an array. And then with dollar $host we insert a host name and here we do a lookup in a hash table. In single quotes only the backslash and the uh, and the backslash uh, single quote are meta characters so or, so only the backslash is really a, a meta character and if you have another single quote inside you have to precede it with a backslash uh, this is slightly different from the shell where even the backslash is not a meta character in the single quoted string syntax uh, strings can contain line feeds, uh, so if you want to uh, include multi-line text, you can just start with a string at one end and end the string many lines later. <clears throat> that has a little bit the risk if you uh, forget closing quotation marks in a string, then Perl will just read the string to the end of the file and then complain that it didn't find the closing quotation mark. Um, Fortunately, the syntax highlighting in modern editors will immediately allow you to find where you made this mistake. So this is not actually too difficult to get out of. And also copied from the shell with a couple of extensions is the so-called here docs. Uh, you can uh, use in any Perl line double less than sign followed by the name of an end of text terminator, for example here simply EOT, and then the subsequent lines up to and excluding this end of text terminator will be inserted as a scalar value into the Perl expression at this point. Let's have a look at arrays. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Programming languages fall in two categories, those that start arrays at zero and like C and Python and Perl is one of these and those that start arrays at one, which are usually more programming language designed for mathematicians who do linear algebra like uh, Fortran, uh, MATLAB, Julia or start arrays with one. Uh, in fact, uh, there is a global variable that you can use to switch whether Perl array start at 0 or 1, but I've never seen that used in practice. So for all practical purposes, array start at index 0. And therefore, the last index of an array is the length minus 1. This is what you get out here. If you <coughs> execute a Perl expression, then that Perl expression is always executed in a context. Perl always knows whether to expect from an expression a scalar value or an array. In fact, inside a Perl function, you can even ask with a function called once array whether the calling function expects at this place a scalar or a uh, array return value. And if you explicitly declare that you want this array to be executed in to be evaluated in a scalar context then what you get out is the length of the array the last element plus one you can construct uh, lists by using the comma uh, in order to join together scalars into a list 
it's customary to put parentheses around this. This may often be necessary due to precedence rules, but it's not actually the parentheses that are the constructor of the list. The list is being constructed by the commas here, really. Um, if you nest list inside each other, they lose their identity. So one comma, two comma, three is the same as one, two, three. This is a consequence of the comma is actually the list constructor and the parentheses are just for operator precedence and therefore don't make any difference here. If you actually want to nest lists in each other, then you first have to convert a list into a reference to a list, like a pointer to a list. And this is what square brackets do. So you could write this expression here as one comma square bracket, two comma three, close square bracket, close round bracket. Then you have an array where the first element is a one and the second element with square brackets would be a reference to an array. And this is how nested data structures are done in Perl. There's one exception um, to the rule that uh, round parentheses aren't actually array constructors, namely if you just use an opening and a closing round parenthesis, the special syntactic construct will actually return a null list, a list of length null. <clears throat> you can uh, assign something to a list if you have an array, you can array assign the array to a list of variable names. If you just write $a, $b, $c, then $a in parenthesis and you assign to it, then $a will get the first element, $b the second element, $c the third element. If you want to skip an element, you can have in this list the undef value, then the second element here will not be assigned to anything. So here one will be assigned to $a, two will be discarded, three will be assigned dollar b and if at the end of such a list assignment you provide an array variable like here at c then the rest of this array here four and five will be assigned as i've shown here one of the arrays that's defined by default is at arg v and that just contains the command line arguments that were passed on by the shell to the program and Finally, hash table. You can initialize a hash table by just assigning to a hash table variable an array, and then this will be interpreted as key value, key value, key value. Um, there is an alternative syntax, which is really just a synonym for the comma here. You can use the greater than, less than sign, which looks a little bit like an array, an array that maps one thing to another thing. It will also just result in exactly the same uh, list, but here you can see a little bit more clearly that this key is mapped to this number, this key is mapped to this number, this key is mapped to this number. But it's really just an alternative for the comma operator. Uh, this is sometimes called as syntactic sugar, where some additional syntax that isn't strictly necessary functionally is added to a programming language to allow programmers to make code a little bit more readable for uh, humans. Perl has quite a lot of syntactic sugar and one of the mottos of the language is that there is more than one way to do it as a result of this. So if you want to access a element from a hash table you use the curly braces so here we have the keys here are strings so we feed a string here in and then this expression here will evaluate uh, to 19 except well on this side it will evaluate to 19 on this side here because it's on the left hand side of an assignment we don't actually look up and return the value Instead, we're going to overwrite the value. So what's happening in this line here is that we look up the value 19, we add six, and then we write back the value 25 into the hash table to overwrite the original value 19. So this <clears throat> looks a little bit like a hash table look up, but it isn't actually uh, the same operation on the left hand side as it is on the right hand side. Something similar happens here. The delete operator removes the entire key value pair Charlie and seven from this hash table. So this again looks a little bit like 
an access like retrieving the value associated with the key Charlie. But in fact, this is treated more like this here on the, on the left hand side of an assignment. The delete operator uh, performs this lookup itself and then uh, removes that value. If you want to get a list of all the keys, Adam, Bob, Charlie, you just write keys percent H keys the uh, followed by the hash table. Likewise, there is uh, an operator called values that will give you only the values. If you want to nest hash tables, you need to create a reference uh, for a hash table because only you can't put a hash table inside another hash table or inside an array. These values here, like array values, they can only be either scalars or they can be references. So to nest something, you uh, <clears throat> define a hash table by surrounding the list that defines the hash table with curly braces. So if you wrote here curly brace uh, Adam 19, Bob 22, Charlie uh, 7, then you would have received a a reference and that you would then have to assign to a scalar variable because scalar variables can contain references. One predefined hash table is percent env and that contains the environment variables that the shell has passed on to the Perl process. And for more information about uh, Perl variables and data structures, please refer to the man Pearl Data Manual.